Um, yeah, hello, my name is Marina. I'll be speaking about bubble struggles uh, with, uh, about cold graph visualization with Radar2. I've been last year in, in 2015, and let me ask you, how many, how many of you are, are French in the audience? Some hands up? Okay, hello. Yeah, that's my favorite, favorite nation next to Austria <laughs> for your uh, beautiful malware. Um, yeah, so right, I'll be talking about cold graph visualization, and um, I came up with the title because I was in a hurry to submit the talk, and I'm not very uh, proud about the bubble struggle title. So I decided to give myself a more interesting title myself and called myself Graph Dracula for today. <laughs> I'll be showing you how to extract interesting information out of call graphs about binaries that you might be analyzing with Radar 2. My full name is Marin Maschalek. I'm a malware researcher. I'm currently working as an independent contractor. I'm based in Austria, Vienna, and I'll be speaking about why static analysis nowadays is king or in my case, maybe rather princess. Um, I, I've been analyzing malware now for six years, and um, I'm, I'm by nature rather lazy. And when you look at lots of binaries, you keep seeing repetitive patterns. Like, in fact, I believe the, the malware code that we see today is a, a large amount of binaries that all is based on some very few entries on Stack Overflow. So I really do believe that the large portion of malware that we get to see nowadays is really rather stupid. Um, still, we spend a lot of time, a lot of our rather expensive time, on analyzing these binaries and trying to find out what they're actually doing, what they're all about. So, um, lots of us use sandboxes to, to analyze binaries and to extract information about what they intend to do. And if you think closely about sandboxes, they are not, not actually all that well fit for, for analyzing lots of binaries uh, automatically. Why is that so? Why, why do I think that static analysis is more important? I prepared this uh, beautiful animation for you to understand of why I started this project for static analysis. Um, I'm a, I spent a lot of time working in incident response, and if you get to an incident response site, your, your customer usually thinks he's been hit by the most aggressive nation-state malware. Um, the sandbox that you feed with that malware usually shows you that it's probably packed or shows some evasion. Then it, it shows you the setup of the malware, then it shows you that it calls home, and then things start to go sideways because, as I said, sandboxes are not usually built to, to analyze entire binaries. A sandbox, by nature, um, can execute an executable that, that you hand over to the sandbox, and it can show you what the, the binary wants to show, which in the case of, of a standard uh, remote uh, access tool or, or standard banking trojan is usually the setup. So this is, uh, in, in, in very many cases, all that you see. This is especially true if you look at, um, at DLLs or the plugins, or also if you look at GUI applications. Working in incident response, I also very often had the problem that we were handed over supposedly benign files and the customer would ask us, can you prove us that these files were not, uh, not compromised? And um, we were there sitting with the sandbox, and I was like, no, like, the sandbox can't actually tell you uh, whether there is no malicious code in there, because it just tries to find malicious code. But uh, if the sandbox doesn't find malicious indicators, you still can't tell whether the binary is actually compromised or not. Finally, um, what do I think? If I'm handed over a piece of binary from, from an incident response case, uh, I usually start thinking it's ransomware, because in, it feels like 95% of all cases, it is actually ransomware that you get handed by a customer. And finally, what the malware really does is, well, a lot of things that you won't be able to see uh, with the sandbox or with, with dynamic analysis in total. Um, if you think about the, the classical remote access tool, the, usually, the authors usually try to fit as much functionality in there as possible. So usually they feature a keylogger, or they can take screenshots, or they can take audio captures, or they can send random information from the computer back to the CNC server, or they can receive commands or receive fresh binaries to execute. Uh, and do whatever the author uh, wants them to do. And this is something that I didn't, I didn't see any sandbox ever telling me. This is why I came up with a tool um, built on Radar 2. I tried to disassemble entire binaries and extract information about that given binary. This is the GitHub repo, and here is the link to the GitHub repo. I called the tool R2 Graffiti due to lack of, of better naming. And what it tries is it disassembles the file, tries to find the functions within the file, tries to find the cross-references within these functions, and tries to find the API references, so the, the references to symbols within those functions, and reference strings to add information to the actual call graph of the binary. The tool 
is built for Python 3. Um, uh, I'm a Python 2.7 person, but I was told that Python 3 is the future, so it's Python 3 compatible, but should also run with Python 2.7. It uses Radar 2 and R2 Pipe. Um, you wouldn't believe how many weird looks you get when you tell people that you actually work with Radar 2. I've also attended the talk yesterday about Bincat, which I thought was an excellent talk, but I do not, do not agree with the speaker saying that no one is using Radar 2. Like, there are certain use cases where you can use that tool as well. The call graph is persisted with Network X. Network X is a, a graph library for Python, so you can technically use any, any data that you can represent as a graph and store as a Network X graph, which is very useful. Network X also supports a lot of algorithms that you can apply for extracting information and so on and so forth. So I personally have to say I'm, I'm not a specialist on graphs. I do not think at the university I have ever heard about graph theory itself. If I did, I do not remember. And um, this um, uh, is actually also not, not quite that necessary if you want to just create the graphs for uh, visualization. Moreover, if you have such useful binary uh, libraries as NumPy and PyDeep that help you analyze the graph automatically. Also, rather irrelevant to this talk here, there is a connector for a Neo4j graph database, so you can actually persist the graph in a database and extract it from there again. Okay, so much about the tool. Um, Radar 2. Why did I use Radar 2? There is a stack of reasons for using the tool over other disassembly frameworks and a stack of reasons why you would not do this. My reasons were it's scalable, it's open source, I can pull up as many instances of it as I want, and it's scriptable. It's like fully based on the command line. So I can, in theory, pull up, I don't know, 500 parallel instances and start disassembling en mass. I haven't done this yet, but I wanted to keep that option an actual option. Also, if you have great support and quick bug fixes, which they need, and I will talk about this in a minute. On the other side, um, as of rather recent, I believe, they support analyzing entire binaries, which is a thing that many other uh, disassembly tools that I looked at do not support. So, Rodari provides an actual interface to an analyzed binary where you can extract things as cross-references and symbols and strings within the binary with very simple commands. The commands I've listed here, um, don't look too closely, they're rather quite confusing. But this is the, the stack of commands that I needed for, for creating my, my graphs. Um, people kept telling me that there is a rather steep learning curve uh, to get to Rodari. Um, and, I, and I tell you, I just skipped that learning curve. Like, I didn't, didn't try to understand the actual commands that well. But I, I usually go the way I post my problems to the Rodari Telegram channel, and the Telegram channel shoots back command lines. That's how it works. You can, you can try to read the documentation. There is actual, there is documentation for the commands, but not for all of them. And sometimes you have to combine the commands to get to the actual value that you, that you want to get out of the, of the binary. And then it's very hard if you don't uh, want to read all of the documentations for all of the different commands. Radar is very nice because you can concatenate commands. So you can say A for analyze, X for cross-references, T for I don't know what, and J for JSON. Then you get all the cross-references for a particular address in a JSON format. This is how, how the Radaria command structure works. And this is very hard to understand. So I decided I wouldn't. Although Radar is a very nice project, so I met lots of their core developers, and uh, they're actually really nice people. Like, there's people behind that, that project, for real. And uh, they also really like to talk about their project. They're actually actively working on it and trying to improve it. Um, and one of the reasons why I decided to use Radaria was because I wanted a disassembly framework that works. Um, I, didn't, uh, I didn't realize when, when I started on it that it's actually the user base that uses a tool that creates the quality output because they bug the developers to improve their, their tool. So this is one of the reasons why, why I think that more people should use Radar 2. However, for my project, um, there's one, one single uh, feature that I needed that was function detection. Function detection is key for creating call graphs because you need to know the functions so you can find the, the, the edges and then you can create an actual call graph. So if you don't find the functions, you don't get a call graph. It's as simple as that. So I did some testing on, on uh, the function detection from Radari and it's a thing they don't have. They don't have an out of the box analysis uh, bootstrap for PE files, but you have to feed it certain commands and configurations so you will actually get there. And once you did it, the function count uh, more or less correlates with the other disassembly framework that lots of people use. I, I didn't dare to put the name on the slide up there because I didn't want to have any tomatoes thrown at me on stage. 
So I just call it the, the other disassembly framework. And uh, the other disassembly framework produces very good function detection output. So the quality of, of their disassembly is, is a very high standard. So I dared to compare the other two to, that, to, to the other numbers. And uh, it turns out for, for 32-bit and 64-bit 64 uh, 64 benign files, the function detection is slightly off. Like Rodari finds more functions for the reason like um, on the one hand, for example, they define uh, exception handlers as dedicated functions while, for example, Rodari will inline them in the function or show them as part of the actual function that references the exception handler. But also, they have a bit of a problem with data structures. So if the compiler decides to inline data with the code, Rodari uh, doesn't necessarily figure out that's, that's data structures straight away if it doesn't search for these particular data structures. So for example, jump tables, it will find properly, but if you have strings or other data mixed within the code section, that's an issue. But it turns out that this is mainly an issue with benign files, because if you look at the numbers of malicious files, you'll find out that these are much more, um, much more compliant with the other disassembly framework. Also, overall, malicious files are uh, altogether a bit smaller than benign files, for obvious reasons, and uh, they're easier to analyze with Red R2. R2 has a bit of a problem with large binaries, so if you feed it a binary, um, like let's say a bit bigger than two megabytes or up to four or five megabytes, it will take a very long time for it to analyze the actual code section. It has a benefit though if you feed it very small files, such as most malware binaries, because it doesn't have to open up a GUI. This, I realized when I, I, I made these comparisons, like with malware, Radari would be faster, and with benign files, either would be faster. Again, obvious reasons, the uh, GUI of, of either is a bit unnerving in, in analysis tasks. Okay, so here's where, where I started from. Now, let's talk about the graphs. The tool um, searches for functions, as mentioned before. These are used as nodes and searches for cross-references among those functions, these are used as edges. The um, references by themselves are used two different types, like references from one function to another of one type, but references outside of the actual code section are indicators for me that there is dynamic initialization of actual executable offsets, like for example, dynamic API loading, and uh, I also store that information alongside the graph data. Yeah, as I said, we have nodes that are the functions, they have of course, an offset, you have a size, and you have a calling convention. The edges are either calls or indirect calls. Indirect calls meaning references to code that are indicated by jumps, uh, for example, where the actual target of the call was initialized dynamically. I make a difference between those two because the direct calls are rather trustworthy, while the indirect calls aren't entirely trustworthy, because it could be that a dynamic target Another resolve uh, in, in my parser, at runtime uh, possibly contains different offsets that are very hard to, uh, to verify statically. So sometimes I miss those edges and sometimes I have those edges to only one target while there's actually different targets that are initialized dynamically. And this I, I can't find with, with the parser in a static way. The strings, if you've ever analyzed malware from a, let's say, um, very unconscious author, you might realize that if you just only look at the strings that the binary exhibits, you can actually derive information about the behavior of the binary. Very often they show, for example, CNC commands that are stored as text, or um, the names of APIs that are being loaded dynamically, and so on and so forth. So if you just look at that list, you might find out what the binary is actually doing. Therefore, to preserve such information, I parse the strings out of the binaries, and uh, the beautiful thing about call graphs is that they offer a certain level of evaluation of the, of the strings that are referenced. So if you have a string, if you, if you parse a string out of the binary, you can't naturally know that it's a real string because, the, um, for example, the strings command doesn't, doesn't offer any logic to say whether this is a readable string or, or actual garbage. So there needs to be some evaluation. And uh, the cross-references within the call graph offer such evaluation. Like if you, if you see that the string is actually used within the code section, um, you have reason to believe that it's an actual string constant and not garbage data that's parsed out of the binary. What you can also do, what I will be talking about a bit later, is you can apply character frequency count. This is something I learned when doing um, cryptanalysis uh, exercises, like very simple uh, brute forcing. Cryptanalysis, like for example, a simple 
uh, XOR or, or something that's actual cryptography you can still brute force. And then you have to evaluate the, the output of your, of your brute forced results. And uh, that's frequently done with character frequency analysis. So you see whether the characters that are contained within the result actually comply to some spoken language. There is a table of character frequencies for, for the English language that I adapted to binary needs. As I said, I will be talking about this in a minute. Um, then another challenge that I found searching for strings was the, the, the detection, detection of string lists. Uh, frequently, lists, uh, strings are stored as a list within the binary and referenced at runtime like dynamically by index. And this is a problem if you evaluate them, you evaluate them by, by cross-references. So if you trust the cross-reference, you will only see the first string that's referenced, but not the list that's following after. And to counter this, I built some uh, string list detection where I just follow down the strings and see how many readable strings I can find that follow my, my reference string. Now finally, what's the information you can gain from strings? Of course you can read them, like if you visualize a graph and show all the strings, you can read in the graph where which string is being referenced. But um, there's more to those strings. Like, I started that project partially for analyzing uh, targeted binaries, and they frequently, they, they come without runtime packers, but they like to apply string obfuscation to hide their, their initial intents. So one of the important information that you can gain out of strings is how readable they are. How many readable strings are there? And is the, the amount of readable strings enough? Or could you imply that strings are being obfuscated within that binary? Furthermore, the APIs. Here's a screenshot of how Radari2 shows symbols within the binary. And all I did was just uh, walking down the cross-references of symbols that Radari would speed out to find my API calls within the binary. Therefore, again, we have the problem of indirect calls. Like frequently, you, you will find not a, not a call instruction when looking up the cross-references of a symbol, but you will find a move or, or a load instruction or something else that uh, dynamically assigns the offset of the, of the function to, to a register, for example. And then you have to follow down the graph where this register is actually being accessed to find out where it is called and, and more importantly, how often it is called. This again is, is useful because this is frequently done, but um, it also implies some certain errors. If, if the APIs within that register change, you, you still only see the call EAX, for example, but the, the value can change at runtime, and this is very hard to find out uh, statically. Finally, what I had to apply was some sort of thunk pruning, because uh, a lot of thunks uh, induced by the, by the linker are an issue with call graphs. They blow up the call graph and show you lots of APIs that aren't actually being called in the binary that just exist within the thunks. And of course, dynamic loading is an issue. So if, if the malware uh, decides to dynamically load its APIs, for, for example, through load library and get proc address, you will not be able to see this uh, in a static manner or not very well. But what you can see is that it's happening. So this is one of the interesting features that I found. I wanted to find out about the binary, whether it tries to dynamically load APIs that I would have to analyze further. All right, finally, how do I deal with, with other indirect calls? So for example, there is APIs like create threat or, or set windows hook X to use certain handlers for, uh, for executing their, their functionality. Like for example, if you see a keylogger, most of the keylogging uh, functionality will be hidden in the, in the hook uh, handler of set windows hook X. And um, this, is, this is difficult to find as a call cross-reference. Like you will have a, a function cross-reference in the code, but you won't see that being called, but being pushed on the stack or otherwise process. You have to follow that down uh, with particular interest. And more importantly, I tried to do a bottom-up sweep for, for indirect calls, looking at all the disconnected nodes that I had and trying to find their cross-references in the call tree. This is also rather quite error-prone, because if you, if you see a cross-reference, like a data cross-reference of a function offset within the, uh, within the trace, it still doesn't mean that the function there is actually being referenced. It's just an idea that it belongs somewhere in that area of the code. So these, these edges are particularly tagged as being indirect, and that has to be considered when looking at the actual visualizations. All right, so much about the parsing. Finally, the graph structure. Um, I did that slide this morning. I just copy-pasted the documentation out of my script. Uh, but the main idea that uh, I wanted you to get was that there is the functions as nodes, of course, 
There is function references and indirect references as edges. There's API calls as attributes of the node stored within the node. And there's strings also stored as lists within the node. I'll later be speaking about um, transformations of, of the graph structure to get out specific information from the, the APIs and strings in particular. And now finally, I started this project not with the idea that I needed to visualize my graphs, but I created visuals to improve the quality of the graphs. So I started with visualizing the, the structures as, uh, as dot graphs to see what's happening where and whether my parser actually um, had, had the right output. So whether I found all the functions, whether the functions looked like they were supposed to look at. And uh, whenever it happened that I talked to people about the graph project, they were expecting to see visualizations because what else would you do with the graph structure? Um, so yes, finally I started to visualize them and that's why I'm here today. But as I found out, I had started to visualize binaries way earlier than when I started the project. This is my left arm. This is a jump table that I analyzed in 2013 that I found very particularly hard to analyze. So this is a visualization that I did uh, years ago. But you'll find out that this is not utterly useful. Because <laughs> useful ain't easy. Um, that's something that hit me first when I tried to do machine learning on binaries, and it hit me again when I tried to do visualization on binaries. There's a lot of options, there's a lot of tools, and you can try a lot of things, and you will get a lot of graphs. It just doesn't mean they necessarily tell you anything. So as I said, I started the project with visualizations in dot, and it turns out that dot is like a, a, a tree structure, so you can put all the nodes as a tree together, and uh, with small binaries, it works very well. Like, you get small trees, and you can follow down the tree and see the paths perfectly well. But as soon as the binary gets, like, reasonably big, let's say some hundred kilobytes, the, the graphs will look like this. This is a piece of ransomware. Um, uh, usually marketing departments get very excited when you tell them you visualize. I showed that to, to the marketing department of my former company, they were not, not excited. So what can you do with the graph to make it actually useful? Well, first of all, there are certain attributes of a graph depending on the visualization algorithms that you apply that you can see at the first glance. This is very simple. Like, for example, you can see whether it's a large graph or a small graph or a dense graph, or a very loose graph, or you can see whether you have subgraphs that are disconnected, or you can see whether everything's very well connected. That gives you a base idea of how much code is there in there. Um, an interesting case was uh, the, the recent the WannaCry uh, ransomware. If you look at the call graph of it, it's like, I think, 10 nodes, but the binary is, what, I think a megabyte, or, or some hundred kilobytes, so it's like very big, but with very little code. And uh, if you look at that, you can, you can uh, retrieve the information that there's a large uh, resource section in the binary. But that's like very simple uh, information and you don't necessarily need visualization algorithms to find it out. What's more interesting in particular, um, with a static analysis tool, you will finally have a way to look into exports of a DLL. No sandbox I saw ever is able to automatically analyze every single export of a DLL. You have to, uh, there's some where you can configure which export to call and which arguments to hand over, but they won't like show you automatically. So with this tool you can. Also you can finally analyze GUI applications, which in the sandbox is also rather quite tedious. Um, you can see spaghetti code. I swear if you look at malware, you will see a lot of spaghetti code. And I started thinking that most malware is actually copy pasted from Stack Overflow because you also see a lot of similar spaghetti code. Um, you see copy paste code. If you, for example, see a large graph and then a small graph next to that large graph, you can uh, retrieve that this was not actually developed within the, the former code base. You see that in a minute. You can very easily spot packed code. Um, some, uh, a while ago, I asked someone working on, on runtime packers how he actually retrieves his packed samples and how he verifies that they're packed, and he said PID. I don't know if, how many people have ever worked with PID in this room. Are there some, some hands? Okay. Uh, uh, PID works with, with signatures for, for entry points. So there's a stash of of signatures, byte signatures, that are compared to the entry point of the binary. And it doesn't matter how often I tried PID, I always find out my binaries are modello packed. So something, something's clearly wrong with that, that signature matching uh, approach. Anyway, we also see repetitive patterns and noise. So let's get to the, to the visualizations, because that's why I'm actually here. Um, a simple visualization with a dot algorithm again. You can see again the tree structure. But with certain highlighting features, you can see whether there's uh, bigger nodes and smaller nodes, saying that they have a high out degree or low out degree. And with the coloring in this graph, you can see how many API calls 
are, are happening within the particular node. So you can, for example, spot a certain area of the graph, like highlighted here, that is of particular interest to you because there is, um, is highly interconnected and has a lot of API calls to show. As compared to that, if you look at a graph that does not exhibit a lot of API calls, you might be able to spot a subgraph like down here, the green one. Um, green in this case means there are zero API calls happening within that node. And in this case, we have a large subgraph that's rather quite disconnected from the main code body up here, which doesn't show any APIs. And I just see that you can see edges on here, like this, this gray mist in between, that's the edges. Anyways, as I said, dot is not very useful in, in visualizing large binaries. So one thing that I was, that I was working with was a particular um, highlighting uh, idea. This is just a, a sub-project of the actual uh, graffiti tool. It's a transformation where you can feed particular um, items of interest to the parser that will be looked up in the graph and then highlighted in a visual way. So for example, you can start searching for particularly formatted strings or a family of API calls. This visualization here shows you um, a count of any API call that contains the string alloc in one or another way. So you can, for example, search for memory allocations within the binary or search for, I don't know, strings that contain the word error or, or strings that contain the word C and D or whatever you like. So you could just highlight. But then you still have the problem that the graphs get really huge and you have to find a way to make them more feasible. So how to deal with large graphs and too much information? That was the main uh, issue that I faced. I had to, to understand the, the data that I had to find out what I actually wanted from the data to be able to visualize that. I found out the biggest problem you'll face with call graphs is data reduction and simplification. You have to know what, what you're looking for, you have to know what your data supports, and you have to know what your algorithms and your visualization tools support. This doesn't always comply. So I once had a customer who would hand over a stash of binaries and said, like, these are, this is his, his APT that hit him, and he wants me to derive a timeline of how the attack happened. And um, this is something that clearly doesn't work. Like, if you, if you enter a project with these kind of um, ideas, you won't get very far. So this is why I formulated certain goals. Like, I wanted to work with layout algorithms to simplify my data. I wanted to use graph transformations to find the interesting bits within the graphs and then work with API gadgets and highlighting to show that uh, in, an, in a visually nice way. And as a last point, I'll show you what I did with the, with the string constants, because the string constants doesn't really, uh, don't really go well with the, with the graph visualization. First of all, one of the algorithms that I used that didn't turn out like extremely useful, but nice to look at, was the fruchtermann reingold uh, algorithm. It's terribly German. By the way, the tool that I used mainly for visualizations is Gephi which is now like the, the shining star for graph visualization. It's, it's really nice, it's rather fast because it's able to, to leverage your GPU for, for graph uh, calculations, but it's also built in Java and it's not quite interactive. More about this later. So with this algorithm, your, your graph is, uh, is built in a, in a circular way, which helps you get an overlook, uh, an overview of all the, all the nodes within the graph. You can quickly spot particular fields of interest, which again, in, in this case, would be um, the exports of the DLL that was, that was analyzed. They're highlighted in red, and their, their uh, name is shown uh, on, the, on the graph. But also you can see that, I'm not sure you can see that here, that these three exports all call this one node that you're highlighted in, in yellow. And that's bigger because it has a high out degree. Um, it's yellow because it's a thread handler. So for me, this would be the node where I would start my analysis because it's the most outstanding node uh, within that graph. Well, this is interesting though. The algorithm takes rather a long time to, to be calculated. So I found out this is rather tedious because for every node where position is being calculated, all the other nodes in, in its vicinity have to be recalculated. So every switch of a node needs the other node that was at the position before to disappear. It's rather funny to, to watch being calculated dynamically because you see all the nodes like popping around, but it takes forever. Although the idea of force directed layouts is exactly what, what we need when looking at call graphs. What's a force directed call graph, a uh, force directed layout? Directed uh, in that case means 
that the algorithm seeks to cut all the edges to an equal length and then tries to have as little crossings as possible. That's the base of where we're starting from. And then, of course, the algorithm applies forces that work out particular uh, areas of interest. In my case, that was the out degrees. So the more out degrees a node would have, the shorter the, the edges would be. And uh, this applied to all, um, to all nodes within the graph. Help uh, showing density, which you can't do with, with the tree structure or with the fuchtelmann reingold uh, algorithm. So this kind of density is what, what helps you group certain subgraphs in the picture. And this is what we're going to look at now. Yeah, of course, also it has a high running time, and it requires a lot of iterations, which is why this algorithm uh, is rather useful applying to a graph that you really want to analyze. For a quick overview, it's rather uh, tedious. How does it look like? So this is an example of a call graph for a rather small binary. It's, I think, a, a rat that was used by Sophocy, maybe? That was, that was my favorite test set, by the way, because Sophocy uh, used a lot of binaries in the past, so it's a large test set, and they're usually not packed, which is also very nice for the call graph generation. Force Atlas supports, uh, Force Atlas is a, a first directed algorithm uh, built into Gephi. It supports a lot of different parameters that you can change, where the most important ones are repulsion and graf gravity. These two parameters help you uh, format the graph either in a very dense way or in a very loose way. The very dense way, shown on the left side, over here the right side, um, help you find particular subgraphs in the, in the binary very quickly because it separates the different clouds of nodes, but it doesn't help you get a, a very nice view of the, of the nodes themselves. In turn, if you modify these parameters, the graph gets more loose and loose and you get a particular view into the different nodes. And by the way, what I didn't do in these visualizations, of course, you can also add all the, all the text information for the specific nodes. So you can add the, the offsets and the size and the API calls and the strings, which um, while well, adding all the strings for all the nodes isn't very useful in the visualization in the first place, but I'll show you how to make that useful as well a bit later. What this algorithm is very useful for is uh, most specifically in finding copy-paste code. This is nicely shown on this binary that also belongs to the Sophocy family. I just see that these graphs look very, very bright. Anyway, so you can see that down here in the, in the bottom corner, there is a subgraph that looks like standing out of the rest of the bubble. And uh, if you have a closer look, um, you, can, you can highlight these subgraphs. And if you have a closer look at the edges, you'll find like one edge that goes towards the subgraph and all the other edges that go towards the, the main code body, probably using libraries or using other functionality provided by the, by the main graph. This is how you spot copy-paste code within a call graph. Furthermore, you can see on that picture, um, again, the darker the node is, the more API calls it contains. If it's bright yellow, it does not contain any API call. So you can see that this subgraph that was copy-pasted in there does not contain any, any calls to um, OS-provided um, APIs. This doesn't necessarily tell you that there's something wicked going on there, but it's, it, it gives you an idea that in there might be um, code that processes data or modifies data or might encrypt or compress or decompress or decrypt data that is being used by the main graph. With that in mind, I decided to look a bit deeper and look into uh, mnemonics that appeared in, in such subgraphs because usually so I'm, I'm not a specialist in crypto either, but I can see when crypto is happening in a binary because I, I see a lot of funky instructions that usually do not happen in productive code. So there you usually see a lot of shifting and rolling and uh, arithmetic operations that help modify tiny values. And if you look out for these instructions, you're able to highlight the density of arithmetic instructions that help you find algorithms. A nice example for this, and this is why I asked how many French attendees are here this year, um, a nice example for this was the Babar malware that I talked about two years ago. Babar is an espionage Trojan that would, for example, try to tap the, uh, the, the computer's, like the, the victim's microphone, to record audio from, from what's happening around the computer. And they used a particular audio codec that was, I suspect, also copy-pasted into that code body. And if you highlight the density of arithmetic instructions within the code, you'll very, very clearly see that the audio codec is 
bright yellow like a torch as compared to the rest of the binary. Now if you have a closer look, uh, look at the edges as well, you will find out that there is exactly this edge that goes up here. That's the entry point to the algorithm, and the other edges all go towards the, the code body, which probably means delivered some library code that's uh, compiled within Bobar. So this way we can clearly see this audio codec in the binary. This is still a proof of concept. Um, so far I've tried this on Bobar and it worked because I know that Bobar has this audio codec. I'll have to find more binaries that actively leverage audio codecs and uh, their own cryptography to be able to say more about whether this works or not. There's also, by the way, an issue like I, I thought I'd look at ransomware and find a lot of algorithms, but turns out that most ransomware that I, that I parsed actually uses the Windows APIs. So they're not, not really happy to, to cook their own crypto, I feel. It's probably better the way. All right, um, after algorithms, what else can we search for? I told you that I, I add the API calls that are happening within the function as attributes to the node. And of course, we can search these. Um, it's not actually feasible to, or, or in, in, in the base structure of the graph, it's not feasible to visualize all the calls for all the nodes because you just get a stack of text in a, in a circular format. Um, so I decided that I would create a, a more dense view of the, of the APIs. This you can do when you map uh, certain API combinations into actual behavior gadgets, as I call them. Well, they are not actually behavior, but some certain sets of functionality that the API calls represent. This is more of a, um, the, this slide is, is more of an illustration. The set that I have on there is not actually finite, so um, I just took some samples and created some gadgets. Uh, if you're working on a particular set of binaries, that you want to, to highlight visually their, their behavior. It is more feasible to go analyze the binaries, extract the behavior gadgets that they exhibit, and create your own uh, gadgets for scanning. The thing that I found out, which was also rather interesting by itself, if I scan for particular behavior gadgets as I thought the functionality would be implemented, I would quickly find out that some authors implemented slightly different, and I wouldn't find that. That was very interesting to see how I believe that uh, a software developer has his own, his own view of how to implement certain functionalities, like he will implement a keylogger, how he thinks the keylogger should be implemented if he didn't copy paste it from Stack Overflow. And uh, in the end, by these little glitches, these little differences, you might be able to create actual signatures for the authors who implemented certain functionalities. All right, but how does it work? So I have these lists of gadgets. And then I just go scanning through the graph. This is surprisingly fast, even for, for, for uh, large graphs. So you look through all the API calls in your graph and search for the first pattern contained within your, your behavior gadget, and then start in a circular way to search around this uh, node to find the actual entire gadget. And once you find the gadget, you can uh, attack the node uh, and, and say that this node has found this particular gadget, and then you can highlight them. This could look as follows. So this is one of the classical rats that I parsed. It shows a lot of uh, threads that it creates, a lot of files that it reads, a lot of APIs that it loads. And for me, maybe most important, the screenshot that it takes. So this is the, the text format of the behavior gadget that you found. But the text isn't nearly as interesting as the visualization. This is a piece of malware that I compiled myself because I wanted to try how, how the actual Actual crooks are working and copy pasted code from the internet. Um, uh, it's also rather rather spaghetti format. So um, I'm again I'm, I'm I'm not good with crypto, I'm not good with math, and I'm also not a software developer. So I really just took that particular code. And when you visualize it, you find out that it has a large code base, but only a very small part of the graph actually exhibits behavior gadgets. This is the the white. Oh my God, it looks terrible. I wish you could see my screen here. It's beautiful. Like the, the background is black, and the uh, functions empty of API calls are visualized in red. Mainly this here is a large API-free uh, cloud. And down here we have a small API-free cloud. And um, here you see a subgraph, or maybe you don't see a subgraph, but here is a subgraph exhibiting a lot of behavior information. You can see if I zoom in. Yeah, that's better. You see all the behavior gadgets and how they're attacked for the node. So you can. Um, with these gadgets, it's actually feasible to visualize the text in the graph because you can still read it. 
I suppose if you would visualize all the API calls themselves, you would have like a never ending job in just reading text. And what can we see here? Um, again, we have this large graph. We have a lot of noise up here, which I found out is not a very huge uh, compression algorithm, but uh, actually library code. You can also see, or I can see here, um, that this is, it looks like uh, a separate graph from the actual behavior graph. So you can probably spot that there is all the library code, and then very densely, uh, very loosely connected, the behavior code that references the library code. And this way, I mean, of course, we can detect library code in binaries with, with signatures and whatnot, but um, sometimes it's very hard, like if uh, unknown or, or code that, that you don't have signatures for, for analyzing is compiled within the binary, you find just large stacks of, for example, OpenSSL. And uh, I don't know how many of you have ever like, tried to analyze the MD5 algorithm because they didn't have a signature. Maybe not so many. Yeah, if you once did this, you spent a lot of time for nothing just to afterwards find out that it's library code that you could like, just have read on the internet um, or I find the sources. So I think in, in larger projects, uh, the visualization could actually be used to find a uh, library code within the binary, so you can find out where you have to start your analysis and don't spend too much time on code that's actually documented somewhere else. Here's again the gadgets. And also there's like, um, again, the, the node size is the out degrees. You have this large node here in the middle that also features a lot of behavior gadgets, and you could just think that it might be feasible to start analyzing there. Of course, you can also color code your functionality families, and in the end, um, I found out this is where marketing starts to faint. If you give them a graph like, look, this is the malware, this is happening here, this is happening there, and it has five colors instead of black and white. That's cool. Another feature I built, though, as I found out the, the graphs are still too large, um, of course, it makes sense to look at subgraphs. So if you found out you have a node that's of particular interest, you can hand it over to the tool and it will create a subgraph starting with that tool. So this is then uh, starting with that node. So this is then your, your super node and all the edges that are referenced or all the, the other nodes that are referenced will follow in the visualization. This looks like you, oh yeah, this can be read. So in the center of this graph, you can see the, the node that I picked uh, as of particular interest. And if I just slide back shortly, you can see here is a, a node that says API loading. This is our, our node. So I saw that and thought there's API loading happening in that node. And then I looked at the subgraph and found out um, there's strings in there that look like user32 DLL and get user object information and get active window and get last active pop-up. These are strings that are referenced within the binary. And you can also see the APIs get proc address and the library being referenced. So you can actually conclude that this function will load exactly these uh, APIs and use them later on within the binary. But of course, this transformation also makes sense for the binary uh, as a whole. Um, it is sometimes useful to, to not look at the node distribution, but also look at which strings are referenced where in the visualization. As I said, uh, displaying them as text, as, as node attributes, isn't always useful. So I put the transformation to just span the graph open as a tree, creating a, a super node that would connect all the, all the unreferenced nodes within the graph and expand the APIs and strings as dedicated nodes. This makes the graphs exponentially much bigger than, than they were before. This isn't always useful. But there was one interesting case where I thought it was hilarious. Um, I looked at the binary that, that I've analyzed some years ago, and I know that it does dynamic API loading. Uh, I know that because I have its jump table tattooed on my arm. So I, I remember that there was no API references within the binary, and what I didn't remember was that there were a handful of them still in there. So if you look at that, that graph, you, you might see some nodes, like here's one in red, here's another one in red, here's a group of them in red, and here's another group in red. So red in this case is API calls that are now displayed as, as dedicated nodes. And if you look closer, there's one that looks like um, it's, it's library code that of course wasn't obfuscated by the author, but if you look at the second bunch, there's also something that looks like you just forgot to obfuscate a group of, of API calls. If you look at the bottom, there's load library in the proc address. That's the, the, the jump table that's being built. If you look on the right side here, you see 
um, APIs that suggest that something graphical is happening, maybe, um, maybe a screenshot is being taken or, or maybe a picture is being changed. So these API calls are in plain within the binary and the visualization tool helps you find exactly these bits where the author forgot to obfuscate uh, their API calls. This is something that's not all that uncommon. Um, malware authors are also just people. Some of them are more practiced than others, and all of them have forgotten something in their life at some point. So if you get a conclusive overview over the entire binary and know what you're looking for, you might find out that you forgot more than, than the obfuscation of a particular set of binaries. I would suggest that uh, in this case, the module that does this screenshotting or whatever is happening there uh, was copy-pasted at a later stage in time, and the guy just forgot to uh, dynamically resolve these APIs and just left them in statically. And as I said, this is, this is happening uh, frequently. I also saw uh, cases before where the author just forgot to obfuscate all his strings and apparently left some strings uh, unobfuscated, which gave me an idea of how to de-obfuscate the actually obfuscated strings. So this is very useful information to extract. One of the last graphic samples that I have today is, of course, you can compare call graphs naturally. I don't know if you see it very well here. Yeah, the edges are again disappearing. Like you have to imagine lots of edges in here. And um, these are two actually rather equivalent binaries with different hashes, of course, that if you visualize them, you see that they are more or less equal. And you can also see little differences within the node structure. You can see that here you have a couple of bigger nodes that you have here as well, but if you count them, you'll find that there's a difference, and you can get an idea of where functionality was added within the graph and start looking there to find out what that was. Um, let me say that graph diffing or similarity research wasn't actually a goal of this project. It just kind of accidentally happened. So if you have a, a small to medium-sized group of, of samples, you can visualize them all and just look at the pictures to see which is the most interesting one where you start. This is very important in incident response, that you start at the important stuff and not at the unimportant stuff, because incident response is usually a very, um, a very nervous sport, I would say. Like, you have to be very fast and have to get information just like yesterday so other people can start to, to clean up the network. Okay, but um, the tools also spits that out in text format, which I found a lot more useful for comparison of, of, of stacks of binaries. By the way, lots of these examples and also the text format of, of some of the projects are uh, published on GitHub if you're interested in text or pictures. Finally, the last thing that I tried to visualize were the strings. Um, I could, of course, like read through the strings referenced within the binary and I would get an idea of what was happening there. But there's very little options to automatically evaluate strings that are being referenced. Of course, you could use a dictionary to try to extract information from the actual uh, words and, and interpret their meanings, but still rather, rather quite uh, tedious. What was it though that, that uh, I thought you could figure out just looking at the strings? Um, yeah, first of all, I already mentioned human readable strings give away information just by being there. So if there's no readable string in the binary, you get an idea that the binary tries to, to hide something. And um, finding out that the string that you have is actually human readable isn't that easy either. Um, the graph structure helps you though. So I found that I get, also if, if you're interested in malware machine learning, I find out that if I look at the cross references, I get a, a, a set of actually relevant strings as opposed to all the compiler induced and, and random uh, strings that are being parsed out usually. But also, uh, as I said before, if you look at the character frequency count, of the, of the words of your string, you can find out how readable or how uh, understandable the string constant is. And that looks as follows. So in this case, I used a binary from the Cheshire Cat family. Here's the Cheshire Cat. Cheshire Cat is malware that's really, really crazy. If someone searches for a challenge, I'm happy to show the binaries. Um, but also, the, the malware would exhibit uh, a stash of, of readable strings that would give away, away information. And if you now run the, the character frequency count on these strings, you find out that at an, at an edge of about 0 0.04, uh, the strings start to become readable and everything that's below that edge uh, might not be that useful in, in your analysis case. This is useful, but a bit problematic if you have short strings. As you can see, there is one up 
here's the pointer that says percent zero eight x. That's obviously doing something with string formatting. That's still a useful string, but that would not be uh, evaluated correctly by the character frequency count. Also for the evaluation, I don't use the standard English language table, but a modified table that's more accurate for strings that you find in a binary. Because the table, for example, doesn't consider uh, numbers or, or slashes or any uh, printable characters that are not uh, A to C, basically. So I have an extended table. And what can I finally do with these numbers? I, I again, I have a stash of, of float numbers. But for once, you can start uh, visualize the strings in a, in, a, in a nicer way. Again, your, your marketing department will faint if you give them these pictures of the malware. Um, but again, this is not, not entirely useful. Like you can see, uh, you can browse through the strings that the, that the malware exhibits and can read them like in, in a graph way instead of a, of a text output. But uh, we still have the problem we have to make that more useful. So what can you actually do with these, these character frequency counts? Like, um, for example, if you'd be interested in comparing the samples, you can calculate the distribution of these, these frequency counts. Um, this works the following way, like you have a list of numbers of, of different length, and you just see uh, how many numbers fit into different buckets. The buckets that I defined for my, um, for my histogram data structure were 0 0.01 uh, numbers wide, and all the values that fit into this bucket were put into the, the actual bucket. So you can see, um, this is a test set of Sophocy. Again, a stash of numbers. And with this stash of numbers, you can then start to visualize these numbers. Um, I just, I, I died when I found that, that, that graphic, literally. So if you have a sequence of numbers, you can put them, you can visualize them as a distribution. I found the histogram is most useful for, for my case, because I don't really do well with curves, but I do rather well with um, uh, edgy, edgy structures. So I uh, generated histograms out of the character frequency count of strings found within the binary. With this visualization, I can compare the character frequency count among different binaries and see how readable the, the reference strings are and how, how well they are uh, understood by humans. But also you can see um, the edge I mentioned before, like the, the fourth edge inside of our histogram, in this case is the green one. So everything that's above the green uh, line in this case is, so to say, readable strings. So everything that's uh, above the 0 0.04 is considered readable based on the, on the tests that I ran. And everything that's below is either garbage or obfuscated or not that readable. Uh, in that case. So here's, again, some Sophocy binaries. They look rather readable, but if you look at a different sample set, you'll find out the strings are not that readable. These uh, samples were not packed, I verified. They exhibit nice code structures. They just don't show any readable strings that are referenced within their code section. So you can see that the green lines are rather low, and uh, the amount of strings on the left side of the green lines are rather high compared to the the right side. So this gives you an idea whether the strings in the binary are readable and how readable they are. All right, now my time is almost over. I have prepared a short demo of a project that I've been working on as well. Namely, the, the graph structures that you get out of, uh, out of Network X, you can transform them into any data format you want. And the most useful I found was GML that you can put into Gephi, which works really fast and you don't have to do much. But you can also dump them as, um, as JavaScript, or as JSON that you can feed JavaScript and then visualize with D3. And D3 is just super nice in, in terms of, of animations because you can update the graph uh, as often as you want. It will always like pop back into, into form. I like that. But also, there you finally have the chance to create interactive graphs, which in Gephi is rather tedious. So now I have, for example, the lists of strings and characters, uh, character sequences and uh, call graphs, uh, sorry, API calls that the node exhibits um, on the left side or on the, whoops, what happened there? Why is my screen gone? That sucks. Anyway, 
I'm almost done. Um, imagine this to be super interactive. So if you know, <laughs> just think it were. Uh, that you can hover with the mouse over, over a particular node and it will show you the list of strings and API calls that are being referenced within the node. It looks a lot better because now if you click on the node, it, the whole graph starts bubbling and bubbling and looks great. Marketing will, will die, I swear. Okay, now finally. Um, of course, the project looks a bit better than in practice it actually is, as it is usual with open source software. Um, there is a ton of issues. Uh, for example, C++ exhibits a lot of indirect calls that I can currently not parse. I'm working on that. Um, Visual Basic, .NET, and Delphi will always be a problem, like for anyone, anywhere. Um, other exotic compilers are potentially an issue too. Large binaries, as I said, bigger than two megabytes, are really hard for Radar to parse. Currently, they are working on that too. Like we're all like eagerly working on, on these issues. And finally, loops and, and the total of inner programming logic you can't get out of a call graph. I had lots of discussions why I don't work on, on CFGs and control flow. Uh, it's, it's a lot more data than I think is, is needed for getting a basic overview of, of the malware. That's why I work with uh, call graphs. Now finally, if I have all these stacks of issues, why am I still doing this? By the way, if you go through a presentation and you search for graphics, you can just put your topic into Google, picture search, and add the word pun. And this is what you come up with. So why did I do this? I wanted to help in static analysis. I wanted to reduce my useless work time on, on boring malware and wanted to find the interesting ones at a, at a quick glance. Um, accidentally, I also built a borderline, bullet, uh, borderline foolproof packer detection. Uh, because if you look at the, the call graph of a packed binary, you, you won't see any. Um, I, I have an easy way to persist analysis results. So if I found out what the binary does, I can tell my visualizer to visualize that. And then I have a nice picture that I give to marketing and they won't bother me again to write a blog post. And um, also unintentionally, I have a disassembly framework bug report factory. So that's what I said in the beginning. Um, if you want to play with Radare, I'd, I'd be happy to, to help you start on it, and also you will find the Telegram uh, channel or the, the IRC channel very helpful where they just spit out command lines. And the more users they have, the more bug reports they get, the better the quality will be. That's how the, the usual process is, and I, I think some of us would be very, very happy to have a, a very well-functioning disassembly framework that works on the command line. And as I said, marketing will love you if you visualize a lot. Um, the tool scales is open source. Uh, you can download it from my GitHub. It's very lightweight. It's um, relatively fast if you don't put too much data in. And uh, you can parse your binaries once, store the graph, and then analyze the graph as, as often as you want. That's rather, rather quick. Finally, I think I have one minute left. Thank you for your attention. And if I have time for questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Hi, um, I was curious if you, in your graphs, uh, or had, had done this or considered looking at the linear distance between functions as a, something to factor into your edge uh, length, mainly because in, a, in a, your normal binary you have kind of similar functions in object files kind of close together, so you have, you know, your main binary made up of, you know, multiple different object files, so you might have, uh, you'd expect to have sort of clustering based on the, uh, the nodes that are cl close together. Oh yeah, sure. I mean, there's lots of ideas and lots of things still to do. Um, I spent most of my time with, with data QA instead of figuring out how to, how to make the visualization better. Um, the thing is, there's lots of ideas on how to uh, how to level up the, the data structure to, to get a more abstract view of what's happening in there, just for simplification. And something you can do, for example, with the, with the behavior gadget. If you, if you find out where the behavior is located that you're interested in, you can level up the graph to um, purge all the, all the nodes that do not contain interesting information, and just visualize the, the, the higher level that you extract from the graph. In general, you can transform the graph in any direction you want. In theory, you could also go down to the instruction level 
Like if you say I have a subgraph that I found out contains a lot of information, I want to see what's going on in there. In theory, you could add the control flow graph or look at the instructions in the visualization. Um, there's lots of options and too little time. Uh, as you said, for dense subgraphs and edge evaluation, there is a, a module from Network X that applies the force-directed layout graph from Gephi onto the graph that helps you search for dense subgraphs. I think that's what you meant. If you, if you can spot the dense subgraphs and, for example, find the libraries that were, were linked, um, you could uh, naturally like, get rid of this large uh, bubble of, of, uh, of nodes and replace it with like, the, the information that there was a, was a dense subgraph. That's totally possible. Hi. Can you, um, can you give us an example of a, uh, of a disassembler bug that your project made obvious? You say that you have discovered an unintentional way to find bugs, right, with this project. What sort yes. of bugs did you expose? Um, tons. So the disassembler of Radari is not the problem. The disassembler works, works very well. The problem that I had was that the function detection would sometimes miss functions. That was then just like disconnected disassembly within the binary, or that they would disassemble things that were not actual functions, like data structures that the binary used to run them. I don't know. I'd be very interested if someone's working uh, on, uh, or analyzing the Visual Studio compiler. I'd be interested which compiler settings um, are at fault that the compiler adds data within the code section. That's a big problem, not, not only for, for Adare, also other, other disassemblers have the same issue, that verification of a function that's being found is very hard. So whether it's a true positive or a false positive is very hard to tell. That was one of the issues. Another year, data formats. Like, I, I would often use commands in a way that looked useful to me, and then the Radari guy said, like, yeah, but you're overlooking that you have, I don't know, combined commands, and th this is why your JSON structure isn't one string, but 25 strings, and you have to uh, combine it back together. So, um, yeah, the function detection was the biggest problem. And then sometimes Radari just updates feature and destroys other features with that, and then you have to tell them, I guess, your feature is broken. And they're very quick in fixing. This is the thing that I love about it, that you, you put in the Telegram channel, like, this is broken, and they're like, okay, update, it's done. So yeah, that was our, our bug fixing uh, odyssey. Thank you.